should say so I'm going to be super rude. Um, yeah. I have a one o'clock in Central, so I'm going to... I'll probably uh, I'll probably be zipping out to my flight. I'm talking to you. So no worries. I mean, hey, it's okay. So if yeah. I told you where you're going to go. I, I will not be offended. Oh, good. I can just clip it on here. Is that one? Oh, that's good. <laughs> I think it works. That way I can do this. Yeah. All right. Uh, what are you teaching right now? Oh, good. Okay, so, but just the one class, so it's not too just bad? Just the one class. Oh, that's good. But I am co-chairing admissions. Yeah, same class, right? Apparently, indefinitely. Uh, I saw, uh, <laughs> I was hanging out with Camille yesterday, uh, oh. last, it was Friday? Oh, yeah. And so she, that's just good. She's, good. So she's, she's, um, she's rotating off of the ALS as I'm rotating my hands, so she's a good one. She is a good one. She is a good one. Jillian Lester is there too. And so, so, so. It's funny with Jillian, I didn't realize she. I knew she grew up in Vancouver, but she actually turned out to be a parent's living in you know, White House. And so, if you want to wait for she day, things like that. So, in Vancouver, um, if there's one you know, the bottom road, um, to my mom's place up on the top of the highway, if you go all the way down to the, the bottom, on the other side, there's a road by the water. If you take that road all the way out to Horseshoe Bay, yeah. there's a place that's just a place called Clock Hill. And her parents actually lived there for years. So it's sort of interesting. We were actually naming like uh, places like, to go. Well, more is like, she's like, no, I grew up on X Street. He's like, I know X Street. Which one is this? Like, Next to the Pink House. <laughs> it's like, that's sort of cool. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Uh, Hello! <laughs>
the last time. Right. writing a final during things today. Yeah, that's actually not a bad strategy. Sorry, Dan, gotta go. Jenny and I have to go to a coffee shop. Why don't you say Ashley and Leslie stay with Dad here? Yeah, because I have a paper due on the second, so... That's tough, too. You guys will be on the Saturdays while we're here, too. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for coming to this year's 2019 Jerome Hall Lecture at the Law School. Uh, Jerome Hall was a beloved faculty member at our school from 1939 until 1970. He was a pioneer in interdisciplinary analysis of legal problems, and his scholarship on criminal law and jurisprudence was internationally recognized. Though he passed away in 1992, his work is still regularly cited today. Professor Hall's focus and approach has a deep place in our institution's history, and the law school's library is named in his honor. Our faculty continue to embrace Hall's work in their research and writing. His work was driven by the belief that understanding how law develops and its impact on society and culture is best understood through interdisciplinary analysis, and that we understand law better when we examine it through different lenses, situating law in its historic, economic, political, ethical, and social context. It's also a belief that the true culture of democracy requires an informed citizenry that is comfortable talking about and thinking about the law. Both law reflects and defines these basic social values. With this background, the whole lecture series brings influential and remarkable scholars to the Maurer School of Law each year. Recent lecturers have included Malcolm Feely from UC Berkeley, Rachel Moran from UCLA Law School, Thomas Green from the University of Michigan, Sanford Levinson from the University of Texas Law School, and most recently, June Carbone from the University of Minnesota School of Law. Today, we're very fortunate to welcome one of the nation's leading scholars on human trafficking and labor, labor migration as this year's 2019 Jerome Hall Lecturer, Professor Janie Schwan from American University's Washington College of Law. 
Professor Chang has had an impressive career. In addition to her scholarship, she has served as an advisor to the United Nations, to the International Labor Organization, and to the Organization on Security and Cooperation in Europe. She served in leadership positions with the American Society of International Law and the International Law Association. She is currently a member of the Freedom Network USA and a member of the Modern Slavery and Trafficking Working Group for the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University. She's a widely read and respected scholar with the most recent book focused on the law, policy, and practice of human trafficking. A graduate of Yale University and Harvard Law School, she worked as an attorney at Cleary Gottlieb, practicing in the area of international law and international arbitration, and ran an international human rights clinic at American University before serving as an Open Society Fellow in Indonesia and teaching at the University of Toronto. Please join me in warming welcome this year's 2009 Jerome Hall Law Lecture. Well, thank you, Dean Parrish, and I also want to thank Dean Ochoa and other members of the IU Law Faculty for inviting me to deliver this lecture. It's such an honor to follow the footsteps of these prior Jerome Hall lecturers. It makes me a little nervous. Um, but a, a, also a tremendous privilege to be here with you today. So as the title of my talk suggests, um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, human trafficking. Um, and kind of give you a sort of broad, sweeping overview of the field. Uh, next year, 2020, marks the 20th anniversary of the modern anti-trafficking regime. And I think it's safe to say that those who developed that regime had no idea what it would become. And so um, my talk is intended to give you a sense of all the, the major shifts in the movement and, and to give you a sense also of some of the challenges we face now and to identify some of the questions um, that we'll have to confront as we go forward in our efforts to combat this uh, human rights abuse. Um, so I'm going to start with the birth of the modern anti-trafficking regime. So during the mid-1990s, International institutions and human rights organizations were reporting increased incidents of trafficking on the ground. We had learned from the Balkans uh, conflict that there was sexual servitude of Bosnian women and Serbian brothels. Um, human Rights Watch uh, issued a series of reports in the mid-1990s about trafficking in Southeast Asia and South Asia. Um, but we were also seeing that trafficking wasn't occurring just in the sex sector, but also outside. And, and many sectors of the global economy, including agriculture, construction, forced begging, camel jockeying, uh, to name just a few. Um, so for example, here in the United States, we had um, dozens of deaf uh, immigrants from Mexico who were forced to sell trinkets on, US, uh, on New York subways. Um, and so as a result of all of these reports of trafficking, human rights organizations started pushing for a more expansive definition of this concept of trafficking. Because what we had at the time was an international treaty um, known as the, um, well, from 1949, that defined trafficking as really just limited to trafficking of women and girls into the sex sector. Um, so there was a desire to expand that concept of trafficking to include trafficking into non-sexual labor sectors. Um, at the same time, states countries were increasingly concerned about border security, um, and particularly the role of transnational organized criminal syndicates in facilitating clandestine migration. So there was an effort made um, to develop a transnational organized crime convention, um, and a decision ultimately to attach to that convention a protocol that dealt with trafficking. Um, this is an important moment because what happened with this move was it set the framework for trafficking, um, it framed the problem as a problem of criminal justice, right, as opposed to a human rights issue. So this treaty, it's important to note, was negotiated through the organs of the, the Crime Commission of the UN as opposed to the human rights organs of the UN. And that had consequences that you'll, you'll see throughout the talk. Um, the framing of trafficking being a problem that was best addressed through aggressive prosecution of traffickers and the rescue of victims. Um, so very quickly, the, the trafficking protocol is um, based on three priorities, known as the three Ps. This is actually a policy platform that was devel developed by the US government, which actually led negotiations over the protocol. Um, so these are the three priorities. 
but the clear emphasis of the treaty is on prosecution. So if you were to actually look at the terms of the treaty, you would see that the language relating to criminalization are all framed, all, all of those provisions are framed in the language of states shall criminalize these activities, um, whereas the provisions that dealt with protections of trafficked persons are framed in the best of UN aspirational language. States shall endeavor to take appropriate measures within their means to protect and provide assistance to victims. And so that is the framework we, we have. That is what the first modern anti-trafficking treaty um, does with, with this problem. Um, it also defined trafficking um, and came up with <laughs> a, a, an astoundingly unwieldy definition of a phenomenon um, uh, that has, I'll, I'll note, has been a point of much contention ever since. We're still debating what this, what this definition actually covers, um, even now, 20 years later. Um, but to break it down for you, trafficking involves three elements. One is an act involving recruitment, transportation, movement, harboring of a person. Second element, by means of force, some form of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of putting someone in exploitation. Now, exploitation isn't defined, um, and that's that's by by design. Um, there is a list of forms of exploitation, so included within there, as you can see from the slide, forced labor, um, practices similar to slavery. Um, but the list that's included here um, is meant to be non-exclusive because the drafters of the protocol at the time recognized that human beings ever so inventive can come up with new forms of exploitation that the drafters had never even dreamed of. And so they left it open-ended so that it could cover other forms of exploitation that might pop up in the future. Um, so the UN Trafficking Protocol was adopted in December of 2000. Um, but two months prior to that, the US government adopted its own um, anti-trafficking domestic law. And from that point on until the t to this day, the US government has actually had uh, an outsized voice in global anti-trafficking policy. Um, despite it being a domestic law, it has long extraterritorial reach by virtue of a rankings and sanctions mechanism that's included in this law um, that effectively has positioned the US in, in the role of what I like to call the global sheriff on trafficking. Um, so essentially what it does is um, every year the State Department is authorized to issue a trafficking in persons report that basically assesses how every country around the world addresses trafficking according to a set of US minimum standards. And so um, those that are compliant are tier one countries. Um, and those that are found non-compliant are tier three. Um, and in between is they're trying, or they're not trying hard enough, but they're trying. Um, and so the consequence, though, is if you fall onto tier three, that puts you um, in danger of being subject to US unilateral sanctions. They're non-trade related, non-humanitarian related sanctions, but the US is, is meant to withhold assistance if you fall into tier three and you don't clean up your act. You're, you're given a 90-day grace period after the release of this report to clean up your act. And if you don't, you may be subject to, to sanctions. Not only US unilateral sanctions, but US multilateral um, support, US support for multilateral aid. So the US will withdraw its support for World Bank projects projects, IMF projects, Inter-American Development Bank, so on. So it's a, it's a, it's a big stick, <laughs> essentially. And so um, the timing of this, this sanctions mechanism um, and the fact that it coincided with the creation of it, coincided with the adoption of the protocol, um, was fortuitous from the US's um, perspective in that the protocol, the UN protocol, lacks an enforcement mechanism. So in that void, this is the mechanism that functionally ends up uh, shaping how other governments uh, form their anti-trafficking policies. So the US essentially has used reputational shame and the threat of sanctions, power of the purse to influence how governments all over the world have developed and shaped their anti-trafficking laws. So many of the policy trends that I'm going to talk about in this lecture are um, can be tied back to US policy uh, because of the tremendous influence that the US has borne internationally. Um, OK, so I'm going to turn to, oh, so here's a slide from the, the most recent TIP report. So countries in green are doing well, countries in red not so, um, 
So Western Hemisphere is not bad. Af Africa is problematic, apparently. Um, <laughs> uh, that's just those are just two slides to give you a sense of the, the how we think about different countries. Um, so the result of, of the framework, I'm going to first talk about the first 10 years, roughly 10 years of the regime. So from 2000 to 2009, um, the, with the combination of the UN trafficking protocol and the US uh, law, um, they, they both feed a narrative of the problem of trafficking um, that I view as highly reductive. Um, the, the narrative is, is that trafficking is the product of individual criminal deviant behavior, and that therefore the solution is aggressive prosecution of traffickers and the rescue of victims. Um, and so uh, we have that narrative sort of uh, uh, encouraged in the TIP report. So. Um, when we're assessing how other governments do, um, a lot of emphasis is put on uh, the rate of prosecution. How many prosecutions are you undertaking? How many victims are you rescuing? Um, and so in terms of implementing this, um, the Bush administration was the, the uh, had the first crack <laughs> at influencing governments around the world. Um, and this was at a time when governments, I mean, this is right after the UN trafficking protocol was developed and adopted. And so um, governments were, were quickly trying to develop anti-trafficking domestic laws all over the world. And the Bush administration, with the power of the purse, was able to really affect how governments shaped their laws. Um, they, the TIP office, or trafficking office at the State Department, um, in addition to producing the TIP report, um, also provided technical assistance to governments. Um, helping them develop their national action plans, provided a model law for, for, to, for governments to adopt, um, technical assistance to create infrastructure to support anti-trafficking prosecutions, et cetera. Um, so a lot of activities on the part of US governments to help other countries deal with, with trafficking. Um, another policy the US government pushed during this early period um, was a, a position, a highly controversial position, um, about what trafficking entails. Um, so during the negotiations over both the protocol and the Trafficking Victims Protection Act here in the US, there was deep and highly divisive debate over the question of whether or not all voluntary trafficking, or sorry, all voluntary prostitution amounts to trafficking. So there's one camp that believes that all prostitution is inherently forced. There's no way anybody could ever choose to engage in prostitution. It's inherently forced, and therefore, it is automatically trafficking. There's another camp that believes that trafficking should only, the label should only apply to prostitution that is um, compelled, so that the, you have to look for an element of external force, fraud, or coercion. The UN trafficking protocol was agnostic, intentionally agnostic on this issue. Um, but nonetheless, the Bush administration, using the TIP report, tried to encourage governments around the world to adopt the former position, which is that all prostitution amounts to trafficking. Um, and it did it through the pressure of the TIP report, but also the, the um, restrictions on grants um, on two pots of money. So there's anti-trafficking funds that might be tapped into to provide assistance to governments and, and NGOs in particular. Um, and then it also attached to PEPFAR, Global AIDS Act money, um, so that any state, any international institution, any NGO that wanted um, Global AIDS Act money, so this is money allotted to HIV AIDS prevention around the world, any of those entities that wanted to tap that fund had to sign an anti-prostitution pledge, um, taking an explicit position against prostitution. That led to an uproar. So this is a policy <laughs> debate, a deep debate, um, leading to an uproar in the public health community. Brazil um, would compromise public health workers' access to a vulnerable population. Because what we understand in, in the public health community is that in order to access um, sex workers or prostitutes, um, you have to approach them with a non-judgmental attitude. Um, and so you can't adopt an anti-prostitution attitude if you're going to access this population. So large swaths of the public health community uh, were in, was in an uproar as a result of this policy. Um, meanwhile, on the ground, um, we saw uh, a number of NGOs uh, created and designed um, 
to engage in raid and rescue operations around the world. So this is one such organization, which is now a very large anti-trafficking organization known as International Justice Mission. Um, and what they would do is they would go into other countries and they would raid brothels, pull women and girls out, um, and, and then put them in a shelter somewhere. Um, at the time, there was a lot of criticism about the lack of aftercare. They, they've evolved so that there is aftercare now. Um, Nick Kristoff from the New York Times, <laughs> the columnist, um, uh, himself uh, reported, and, and he's somebody who's tracked the trafficking field for years, but one of his first actions was to go to a brothel and buy the freedom of two girls um, in these brothels in Cambodia. Um, and since then has written about the problem of, of trafficking. So that was kind of the dominant model, right? That this is a, a crime, we need to rescue the victims. Meanwhile, what, what doesn't get addressed is non-sexual labor trafficking during this period. So this is a shot, a screenshot from a photo of um, the living quarters of um, some of the workers in what's known as the signal case. So a group of about 500 Indian guest workers who came to the United States on the H-2B guest worker program um, uh, were, ended up being trafficked. And they were brought here, or they came here in order to, um, they were pipe they were pipe fitters and welders, and they had come here to work in shipyards in order to rebuild parts of the South after the Katrina hurricane. Um, but they were subjected to, to forced labor, charged 20, 000, up to $20,000 each for recruitment fees, promised a salary they didn't receive. Um, they were put in cramped quarters. They uh, all sorts of uh, horrible conditions that they faced. Um, and uh, so very, the, these are the signal workers protesting. Um, very clear indications of trafficking in this case. but. The Department of Justice refused to, to prosecute this and many other cases involving non-sexual labor trafficking. Um, so this is a slide that gives you a sense of the prosecution statistics. Um, so during this period, we see um, at the bottom, you'll see that there is a parentheses that has a number in it. That's the number, um, that's the portion of case, that's the number of cases involving non-sexual labor trafficking. So you see that it's a tiny portion of the total number of cases uh, prosecuted. Um, and that's inconsistent with what we knew um, was, was the prevalence of trafficking, which is that actually labor trafficking is a much greater problem in terms of sheer numbers of people affected than sex trafficking, yet that statistic is, is the inverse. <laughs> um, of that and, and quite disturbing as a result. So um, when the Obama administration came in, there was, a, there was a decision, a very intentional decision made to try to pivot attention towards non-sexual labor trafficking. Um, and, and part of that strategy was to rebrand trafficking as modern slavery, because modern slavery would conjure images of people working in the fields, shackled in chains. Um, and, and it would also, um, it, it would allow the government and uh, NGOs, everyone in the field to, to take advantage of the rhetorical power that comes with, with the slavery uh, rhetoric, right? It references a shameful past, and, and the hope is that it would incentivize the masses to become modern-day abolitionists. And so this was a position taken at the highest level. So President Obako, Barack Obama um, you know, basically said, we need to call trafficking what it is by its real name, slavery, right? This happened to coincide also with the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, Secretary, then Secretary of State Clinton also reiterated, we need to call trafficking slavery. Um, and, and it did inspire. And so we had, um, it inspired a new group of abolitionists um, who um, really adopted this, this framework um, to engage in, in, in raid and rescue around the world. So this is one um, organization known as Our Underground Railroad, which, which operates around the world. And, and uh, it's, it, the people who work there, I think, are former special ops people, which is why they're so muscular. Um, <laughs> Uh, but they, they take advantage of that rhetoric, right? You, too, with a click of a button, can become an abolitionist because you can go to a kick, you can start a Kickstarter campaign and raise money to rescue people, 
right? Um, and so everyone can become a modern day abolitionist. Now I'll say, you can ask me a Q&A why, but I think the slavery analogy is really problematic for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is it's doctrinally suspect. But in any event, it, it, it has inspired people to do things. Um, <laughs> And I will say that it has also had the benefit of drawing law, doing what uh, folks in the Obama administration wanted, which is to draw attention to non-sexual labor trafficking. So now we know that uh, trafficking can occur in your neighbor, <laughs> neighboring state. Um, this was trafficking involving children uh, working in egg farms. That trafficking can occur um, with, respect, with, with respect to not only undocumented migrants, but documented guest workers, um, uh, and also de facto guest workers. So there's um, something known as the J-1 visa program under the state, it's under the auspices of the State Department. It's a cultural exchange program. That's how um, uh, study abroad uh, people, uh, like Fulbright scholars come in, but it also includes a couple of programs that are really de facto guest worker programs, including the au pair program and what's known as the summer work travel program. And so um, a story broke um, during this period of about students um, who were participating in summer work travel um, who were came from all over the world to work uh, in chocolate factory, Hershey's. Um, and they ended up working for less than a dollar a day for 16 hour days, back, literally back breaking work. Um, and, 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 and that sort of opened the door to, to our recognizing that, that there are some sort of guest worker programs that, that, that exist under the label of cultural exchange that because they are under the auspices of the State Department, they manage even more than our guest worker pro programs to escape labor scrutiny. Um, and so a lot of uh, exploitation in the, in the context of that program. Um, and we also came to recognize that trafficking can occur with respect to not just unskilled or low skilled labor, but highly skilled labor. So we have trafficking of teachers, we have trafficking of nurses. Um, we also learned <laughs> that U.S. taxpayer dollars are funding trafficking um, in the sense that US, within U.S. government procurement chains and government contracting chains um, so, uh, that, that our U.S. government contractors and subcontractors, a number of them that, are, that supply life support services on U.S. military bases in Iraq and Afghanistan are actually engaged in forced labor. So that became exposed in this, in this period of time as people thought about slavery around the world. We also have a broader awareness of how forced labor connects to our daily lives. And so we now know that the food we eat, the clothing we wear, that somewhere in the supply chain, there very well may be forced labor that, that leads to the production of these products. Um, we're assisted by a website that was commissioned by the State Department known as Slavery Footprint. So if you ever go to this website, you can take a survey and you answer, you essentially answer these questions about your consumption habits. And then at the end of the questioning, um, they give you a number that tells you how many slaves support your daily life. Um, and that can be shocking. And the, the goal is to encourage ethical consumption. Um, like this. Um, so we have a few measures being developed. They're small steps, but they're steps nonetheless to deal with um, what we now learn, what we now know about the prevalence of trafficking. Uh, and so one of them is the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act, um, which is a, a disclosure requirement. So basically, if you're a company that, that earns more than $100 million in gross revenue worldwide and you're operating in California, you have to have a website. Um, somewhere on your website, a disclosure as to whether or not there's forced labor in your supply chain. You have to attest to whether um, what measures you've taken to look for to look for forced labor or slavery, and you have to disclose it. Now, you could disclose it that you do have forced labor and slavery in your supply chain. It doesn't require you to actually do anything about forced labor. It just you just have to confess to it on your website. Um, uh, we also have an executive order uh, that requires that now U.S. government contractors and all their subcontractors beneath them have to um, try to not engage in forced labor. Enforcement is a question, but it, nonetheless, there's government contract clauses now that say that they won't engage in forced labor. Um, and now we're also bringing trade law to bear. Um, 
in that we have uh, laws that now allow Customs and Border Patrol to turn away any imports that are made with, with forced labor somewhere in the, in the supply chain. And so this has really come about in the last year or so. We have CBP is issuing these with, withhold and release orders, they're called. And so we're turning away pajamas that would otherwise go to Costco, um, tuna from Vanuatu. We're also turning around gold from the DRC, rubber gloves from Malaysia, among uh, and tobacco from Malawi is also subject to a WRO. So there are a number of actions being taken to deal with the f this, uh, to address the uh, forced labor in the supply chain. Um, so all of these developments reflect um, are pushing us towards a broader understanding of trafficking than certainly that held by the UN trafficking protocol drafters. Um, the sobering reality is that we can't prosecute the problem away, right? So this is from the 2019 TIP report. You see statistics of worldwide prosecutions. Again, the parenthetical <laughs> is the number of labor trafficking cases. So. Um, only in 2018, only 11,196 cases prosecuted. Of those, 450 for forced labor, um, non-sexual labor. So that statistic um, is all the more stark and disturbing when you think about what we're saying is the global statistic of the trafficking slavery phenomenon worldwide. So right now, the statistic is 40.3 million people worldwide. Um, I invite you to ask me about the statistics problematic in some ways, but uh, regardless of whether or not you take the 2012 number or 2000 and, uh, yeah, the 20.9 million um, number or the 40 million number, it's still a lot larger than the number of people being prosecuted or number of cases being prosecuted. Um, this is the statistic from prosecutions within the United States. Um, so labor, a very small portion of the total prosecutions. Um, and so, again, we can't prosecute this problem away. And we're coming to the realization that these post hoc solutions aren't working. And so we need a much more um, robust approach that, that really gets at prevention of trafficking in the first place. Um, and that part of that is is addressing these really deeply embedded society, societal structures that enable, if not encourage, extreme exploitation, particularly of migrant workers. Um, and so we've got to look at our, migrant, uh, our labor migration frameworks much more closely that allow employers to treat guest workers as disposable labor to be employed on the cheap and afforded minimal rights protections. And that to prevent trafficking, we have to acknowledge and address the fact that trafficking and work and broader worker exploitation, um, they're not different phenomena. In, um, they're just different in degree, not in kind. And so if we address lesser you know, broader worker exploitation, we can try to prevent these situations from escalating into situations of trafficking. So we've got some knowledge of, of the labor piece of it and some activity dealing with um, um, trying to, to uh, expand labor protections or, or a lot of uh, advocacy efforts in that direction. Um, but now we actually, um, as of last year, we now have an opportunity to think about it from a migration law framework because um, in, in December of 2018, the international community adopted the global, uh, the UN Global Compact on Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. Um, this is significant because this is the first time that the international community is coming together um, to develop an instrument on migrant work. Um, in the migration law field, uh, you could say that most of migration law that exists deals with asylum and refugee law. There is very little that deals with migrant work. Um, we have less than a handful of treaties dealing with migrant work, and they're p notoriously poorly ratified. And those few countries that have ratified those treaties are countries of origin rather than countries of destination where migrant workers work and, and are most, in, 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 uh, most immediately in need of protection. Um, so they haven't been that effective. Um, and so. We now have this, this international cooperation agreement. It's, it's a non-binding instrument, I'll say up front. And, and also important to note is that the US pulled out of negotiations when the Trump administration came in and, um, and, and tried to convince other countries to pull out as well. And, and they did manage to get some countries to pull out. But, but most countries around the world have actually adopted the, the agreement. Um, and, and, and so the agreement 
covers 23, it has 23 objectives. Um, these are the objectives. Um, and there are a few that are, that are particularly meaningful for, for, for anti-trafficking um, uh, that could be useful for anti-trafficking. So for instance, pro prohibiting recruitment fees, restricting employer <coughs> tying of visas, um, prohibiting um, retaliatory termination and, and deportation of workers who complain about working conditions. Um, but the other thing that, oh, and I'll just say that, that underlying these objectives as with any migration law or policy, are three competing, um, underlying the GCM are three competing objectives. Um, a concern about border control, a concern about access to flexible labor markets, and also a concern about migrant welfare. And so these are really um, competing, they really are competing objectives. Um, and so the question is, how will these objectives be balanced when the GCM, when, when states undertake efforts to implement the Global Compact? Um, so one key part of that is the institution that's been appointed to lead global efforts on migration, the International Organization for Migration, IOM. Um, IOM <laughs> was elevated to this role in the GCM over, it was quite a controversial appointment um, because the IOM um, for a very long time operated on the periphery of the UN system. It was not a part of the UN or anywhere affiliated with the UN until 2016 when it entered into an agreement with the UN to become what's known as a related organization. Um, this is the UN operative language and I point this out because um, it allows IOM to essentially function how it's always functioned, which is an autonomous, non-normative international organization. Non-normative is key to this analysis um, because unlike other UN, organ uh, UN specialized agencies, so IOM had the option to become a UN specialized agency. It rejected that. It decided to be a related organization so that it can maintain its independence. Um, so there are some really important differences between the IOM and, for instance, these other, these are actual UN agencies, all of which have normative protection mandates, right? So they are, their, their role is to protect particular populations for particular issues, right? Um, whereas IOM's mandate is basically to just provide migration services to member states. Um, there's no normative guidance as to what it can do. And so um, it has non-normative mandate. Um, and what's also different about it is it's a project, it receives project-based funding. So unlike UN specialized agencies that operate on core funding from voluntary contributions from states, um, IOM has to raise its own money for projects. Um, and IOM, so this is a list of the field offices, 147 countries. IOM has 500 field offices in 147 countries around the world, um, 10,000 employees. Um, and every one of these offices, in order to sustain their existence, have to come up with projects and implement their projects um, to earn revenue because they don't have core funding. And so um, IOM is known for being uh, entrepreneurial because it has to be. Um, it's also omnipresent. Um, as I said, it's all over the world. Um, and what's also unique about it is how embedded it is in the communities in which it works. So it partners with civil society organizations. It's constantly hosting dialogues about policy, including policy debates, and incorporating new actors in those dialogues all the time. Um, so a slide that sort of gets at the IOM, the headline says it, IOM engages community actors, local government actors to tackle human trafficking. Um, and so, so some of the concerns, and there are many concerns about IOM taking on the role of implementer, uh, sort of lead migration agency, um, have to do with its operational history. Because um, uh, my IOM's, uh, approach to migration issues is, is what it refers to as a migration management approach. It um, assumes that migration will happen um, and that, that really you can't restrict migration 
from happening. Um, and you wouldn't want to because it would harm the necessary circulation of workers in the global economy. And so the goal, therefore, is to manage migration, to sort good from bad migration, um, so that migration can be a triple win for everyone, for countries of origin, countries of destination, and the migrants. But IOM's operational history suggests that we can't be entirely sure that it's a triple win in the sense that it's actually a win for mi migrants. Um, so here's some of the, how, how IOM, has been, IOM operations have been characterized. So they've been accused of trespassing into the humanitarian space of the normative institutions, so that governments will hire IOM to undertake projects that the normative institutions would never touch. So for instance, IOM has built detention facilities to help countries like Australia engage in out, um, uh, uh, processing of migrants offshore, right? So detain migrants on Papua New Guinea so that they don't reach the Australian shore to be able to claim asylum. Um, so IOM has been involved in that that's known as the, as the Pacific Solution. Um, they've built detention systems detention centers, they've run them, they've um, uh, developed assisted voluntary return programs <laughs> that where there's a lot of questions as to how voluntary the return is on the part of the asylum seekers and refugees who are in this program. Um, so the standard scenario is they're kept in detention so long that um, and then asked if, would you rather stay in detention or would you rather return or go somewhere else? Um, and so they, they, um, they have been accused of engaging in activities that arguably violate the principle of non refoulement which is don't send somebody back to a place where they could be persecuted or, or, or tortured or killed. Um, and, and they, but that being said, IOM has done also some good work. Um, they have um, done some really good work with respect to protecting refugees um, uh, and helping them resettle. Um, they provided safe repatriation services to trafficked people. Um, but it's a mixed record. Um, when it comes to asylum seekers, we, we know a lot more about their work with respect to asylum seekers and, as I mentioned, highly controversial. Um, but they've also done some work in the migrant work uh, in terms of labor migration. Um, they've created new migration corridors that didn't exist before. So in, in, in line with their entrepreneurial ethos, we have field offices that will go to governments and propose um, that, that they send their nationals to work in, in other countries as a way, as a, a means of, of gaining remittances and, and furthering development of the country. Um, and so they've engaged in, in, in some pilot projects involving labor migration. Um, oh. So one of them was the recruitment of Thai agricultural workers to work in Israel, um, another, which was the subject of a Human Rights Watch uh, expose, um, because the Thai workers, a number of them died mysteriously, um, and the, the conditions on, uh, in the sector were, were really awful. And IOM was responsible for recruiting the workers into this program. Human, to be fair, Human Rights Watch doesn't really talk about IOM so much, but it was part of this program, and its existence, or its, its participation, certainly didn't stop the abuses from happening. Um, there's another program I don't have a visual of um, that we know a little bit more about, which is IOM's work recruiting Guatemalan workers to work in Quebec, um, also for the agricultural sector. Um, this was not a migration corridor that existed. It, it was a brainchild of IOM Guatemala. Um, and they found that managing temporary workers, well, so they, they recruited these workers to work in Quebec. Again, some really poor conditions uh, experienced by those workers. Um, <laughs> but the IOM Guatemala chief of mission um, uh, that created this program discovered that it's a really lucrative business to engage in recruitment. So he left IOM to start his own private recruitment agency to provide workers for Quebec. So they lost sort of IOM Guatemala ended up losing its market. Um, and then they brought in a new chief of mission who then um, also left to start his own private recruitment agency so that the first chief of mission handled Quebec and the second chief of mission recruited for Anglophone parts of, of Canada. Um, the IOM program ultimately shut down because there was no more market. <laughs> they, all the clients were going to the private agencies and the employees of IOM had defected to the private agencies because it's far more lucrative. Um, 
So the two pilot programs <laughs> where IOM engaged in labor recruitment were not a, a quite, were not really a success. A success. Um, so ultimately, what we understand, from, oh, and on this, um, if we take, if we look closely at the policies of IOM, they we see that they construct an ideal migrant. Um, it's an ideal that serves economic rather than humanitarian interests. Um, so ultimately, freedom is is not in itself a tool to achieve. Um, well, freedom is not itself an end, but rather a tool to try to um, achieve labor market objectives. Um, critics argue that ultimately IOM promotes, um, one critic termed it as um, a hegemonic world order where mobility is managed to promote the interest and benefit of the capitalist ruling class. Um, so that's one way to frame it. I mean, there is a, a deliberative uh, neoliberal calculus at play in IOM projects. Um, where they, they're trying to identify which populations are going to be the most advantageous to global labor markets. Um, so we have some concerns about IOM taking the helm when it comes to global migration law um, and implementing the GCM and the competing objectives because the sense is that um, border control and access to flexible labor markets are going to far outweigh concerns about migrant welfare. Um, and what makes it worse <laughs> is that we also see on the ground, a, a, um, in terms of advocacy movements, a rising narrative that migration is a solution to development rather than a problem for development. And so um, the World Bank, UNDP, has always promoted migration for development purposes. But we're now seeing a strain of argument coming from some development think tanks that are actually being explicit about how we need to be less rigorous about, for instance, ethical recruitment frameworks, because that prevents my labor migration. And, and it's better to accept lower right standards in order to increase the number of people who are migrating, um, because ultimately that will, that will serve development goals and, and the lives of people better. Um, and so we're left uh, with a situation where we have to address the migration <laughs> issues surrounding the GCM, what norms are going to be developed. Um, and, and implemented, um, and, and part of that is really trying to, we have to address the question of what is exploitation. I mean, in grappling with the, these competing interests, we have to ask, you know, how much exploitation are we willing to, to tolerate and for what goals? Um, um, so those are a few of the issues that pop up in the field of trafficking. Um, we can't, much as we, can't avoid, we couldn't avoid dealing with migration um, and had to arrive at the Global Compact because states avoided that for decades and decades. Um, we can't avoid dealing with, with some of these really hard questions about exploitation and what we find acceptable and how we define what is too, too much exploitation and what's enough to, um, in light of people's right to migrate. Um, those are questions we have to grapple with. It's a project we have to undertake so that um, one day when trafficking does occur, it's an anomaly and not a feature of our global economy. So with that, I will take your questions. Thanks so much for your lecture. Um, I was really interested in hearing some more about um, the problematic nature of using that term modern day slavery. Uh. I was hoping you could talk a little more about that. Yeah, so um, I, I said that it was doctrinally suspect because slavery is differently defined. Um, so there's a whole doctrinal piece to this. Um, because trafficking has a much lower threshold. Um, and, and one of the problems, I think, with the slavery analogy, well, lots of problems. So one is that it's, it's inaccurate to characterize modern day trafficking as slavery because there are some really important differences between chattel slavery, transatlantic travel, chattel slavery, and current trafficking. Um, ch in chattel slavery, you had people who were kidnapped and brought here into the UK. Um, in the case of trafficking, most people, most of most trafficking scenarios start with an act of agency, right? It's an affirmative decision to move, to search for a better livelihood or survival. Um, and so that's an important distinction, because if you frame it as 
as, as a problem that involves some element of agency, um, and you recognize that it's agency in a context of limited choices, your policy proposals are going to be very different from a situation where there's no agency exercised at all. Um, more concretely, um, the slavery analogy we've seen in some cases, including the teacher trafficking case, actually, where the, the defense counsel in that case, in closing argument, raised the specter of slavery because what, what he argued all along was, look, it's not trafficking unless it looks like slavery. And, and so in closing argument, he said, look, you know, do you, are these teachers working in, in fields? Are they chained? Are they imprisoned in some way or confined in some way? Um, because in that case, the teachers, they actually testified that they loved teaching. They loved their profession, but they hated the conditions they were in. Um, and so it sort of, it, it Sla the, the slavery rhetoric kind of in, implicitly raises a threshold for, for trafficking, right? You don't need those conditions in order for something to count as trafficking. And so the jury ended up um, not being convinced that this was trafficking, although every element of trafficking was met, right? Um, and so um, the, the lawyers in that case sort of look back and they say, well, you know, the slavery analogy really did us a disservice in this particular case. Um, they, want a settle, they want a judgment based on, I think, um, deceptive business practices as opposed to trafficking. Um, so that's, those are a couple of reasons for my objections. Hi, so over 90% of um, sex trafficked victims have been arrested on charges of prostitution. Um, and recently the DOJ has like allocated funds for expunging their records to make a smoother like reintegration into society. Yeah. Um, however, last year Donald Trump um, exiled these funds for that purpose. And I just wanted to know how you feel about that. And if you do feel <laughs> that expunging these records are critical for survivors reintegration into society. I do. Um, I, no, I, I do not think that's a good policy. And, and the expungement, so a number of states um, are, are passing laws for expungement, uh, vacature and expungement of, of these cases and these records. Um, and that's really important because um, in as much as the US government has pushed, at least historically, um, abolition of prostitution, right? So the, the, the model that they push around the world is that you decriminalize the sex worker or prostitute and you criminalize everybody else um, because you recognize that the prostitute or sex worker is a, a victim. So you don't criminalize them. But that's not the system we have here in the US, right? In most jurisdictions, those who are selling sex are going to be criminalized. And so, um, you know, criminal records carry really, really extensive consequences in, your, in terms of your ability to apply for a job or apply to go to law school. or um, And so, yeah, the expungement piece of it is really, really important for, for um, this population. Absolutely. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I wanted to know your thoughts on the intersection of human trafficking and human smuggling, especially as, like, numbers of displaced persons are reaching, like, record high. Like, this summer I worked on a case where you know, groups of people had paid to come to the U.S., but then along the way it turned into more looking like trafficking where, you know, they're abused or, um, you know, it wasn't what they were told. And so it, it becomes more like exploitation and how the existing framework might address that when it's not specifically sex trafficking or specifically labor trafficking. It's more this like gray area. Okay. Yeah. So um, trafficking, so a trafficking situation can, and, and often does start out as, as a smuggling situation that becomes trafficking. And we still consider it trafficking because, because so if somebody pay, let's say a scenario where somebody pays somebody to get you across, or you pay somebody to get you across a border illegally, um, that's smuggling. That's, that's smuggling is paying someone to get you across the border illegally. Um, the difference between smuggling and trafficking is that there's a purpose of exploitation on the back end um, required for trafficking. So um, as soon as that situation turns into one where somebody is going, to, the expectation is that they'll be put in some sort of forced labor um, or sexual exploitation situation, that actually is a case of trafficking. But that being said, it's a distinction that governments try to avoid, <laughs> right? So it's governments have an incentive um, to deem cases migrant smuggling instead of trafficking, because under the 
go back to the initial slides, the migrant smuggling protocol. Um, so migrant sm smuggled migrants are treated differently from trafficked persons. Smuggled migrants are viewed as complicit in a crime. And so the most they're entitled to under the migrant smuggling protocol is safe repatriation. Right? They're not entitled to states considering letting them stay, providing them with social services. They don't get any of that right? because they're viewed as complicit in a crime. With trafficked people, because the intention is to exploit them later, they're viewed as victims, right? And so governments often will label trafficked people as smuggled once they reach the border um, in order to deny them services. And so it's a distinction um, that that is is without a difference, um, uh, I think, in, in practice in some disturbing ways. And, and governments will often, I mean, it's interesting, they, they will characterize migrant smuggling um, operations as, as trafficking in order to justify um, uh, aggressive action, right? So use of force sometimes um, against, uh, against some of these vessels. Um, and so it, the, and there's a lot of confusion um, over what's smuggling and what's trafficking. And um, unfortunately, uh, the reality is smuggling is really important for asylum seekers. I mean, that's how they get out of the country and somewhere else. And so, um, one of the, even though there's a distinction between trafficking and, and migrant smuggling, those who care about trafficking are, are concerned about migrant smuggling and the onerous sort of um, restrictions put, put on in place with respect to smuggled migrants because it's a population that easily becomes trafficked. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so. You ended your talk with your sense that the IOM is not the proper institution to be administering the global compact. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what you would see as the alternatives. So what would be your proposal? Um, well, it would have been nice if it was the ILO <laughs> um, or OHCHR. I mean, all of these institutions have dealt with migrant work, right? Um, I guess the, the other, so it could, um, and, and ILO wanted that portfolio. They just, IOM was more powerful um, because IOM has the backing of, of powerful states because of its history, right? Um, I had one of the criticisms was that um, IOM is known as an instrument of northern foreign policy, of northern foreign policy, northern states' foreign policies because of that entrepreneurial model, right? So most of their funding comes from rich countries. And, and, and so a lot of their work has been in the service of these wealthy countries. And so it's not actually surprising that IOM ended up being appointed. Um, the other option would have been um, to have IOM agree to adopt a normative mandate. Um, and they refused to. Um, and it's funny, when um, they became a related organization of, of the UN, um, uh, there was expressed hope that they would eventually become a UN specialized agency. I mean, there, there are some who think, well, now that they're sort of related to the UN, maybe by osmosis, these agencies will affect it and maybe they'll start to be more normative, but I'm not so convinced that'll happen. So, I mean, in an ideal world, if they were gonna be put in this position, they would have, they would have been, become an actual UN specialized agency that adopted a normative mandate. Right, like all of these. And so um, I put up this slide. I didn't explain why exactly. But you know, IOM brands itself UN Migration, just like UNHCR brands itself UN Refugee Agency, as if they both are they're similar, but they're not, right, because of the normative mandate. Um, so yeah, it either adopt a normative mandate or give it to an agency that does have a normative mandate and is under the supervision of the Secretary General and all of the accountability mechanisms which you know are not perfect, but um, exist in the UN system. Nope. <laughs> I mean, may, uh, maybe, maybe the pressure of public opinion, maybe, I mean, I think advocates' perspective is we just have to watch them closely. And um, another aspect of IOM is we actually know very little about their operations. They're pretty secretive and because they're so diffuse, um, it's really hard to research. So there was a meeting in Oxford in February where researchers from around the world, we all gathered to talk about how difficult it was to research IOM because they don't have archives that you can search. Like you can't go in and search their archives. You 
you have to know exactly what document you want and ask for it, and maybe they'll give it to you, maybe they won't. Um, so it's really hard to actually track what it's doing, and so um, the only information we have about IOM's operations are from sociologists, political scientists who have been on the ground and looking at the impact of their work. We get very little from their actual documents. Hi. Um, for the think tanks, tanks that you briefly mentioned towards the end that are looking at the, um, I guess, lack of development with migration, um, correct me if I'm wrong in saying that, but I wanted to ask you if there were certain, uh, I guess, requirements or economic policies that would need to be in place in order for development to occur without the rights to the individual, um, just because you briefly mentioned that. Um, it was talked about that the migration is maybe not bringing the development that once was thought it was thought to bring. Oh no, it's actually the reverse. So oh, okay. the idea okay. is that from the development, there's a migration as development, right? Migration is the solution to our problems with development. We need to send more workers abroad so that the remittances can come back in and and lead to development, lead to you know. Great, um, uh, stronger economies back home. And so the idea is our solution is let's get more people to migrate. And these think tanks, um, one in particular, the Center for Global Development, which is a really prominent development think tank apparently, um, it has a proposal in the works called its Labor Mobility Project, and it wants to create temporary work programs around the world um, along this model of, well, let's balance it so that there aren't so many rights that, that we impede migration, um, yet let's create these temporary labor programs all over, right? That's, that's the goal. Um, and, and they're getting significant funding for that. Okay. We're out of time. Please join me in thanking Professor.